The five men on board Ocean Gate submersible were confirmed dead in what the US Coast Guard believes was a catastrophic implosion. The debris is consistent with the catastrophic loss of the pressure chamber. Upon this determination, we immediately notified the families. On behalf of the United States Coast Guard and the entire Unified Command, I offer my deepest condolences to the families. The men on board the sub included 58-year-old British businessman Hamish Harding, Stockton Rush, the 61-year-old CEO of OceanGate, 48-year-old British Pakistani businessman Shazada Dawood and his 19-year-old son Suleiman. The fifth man on board, Paul Henri Najole, was a 77-year-old renowned explorer. Dr Michael Guillen was the first TV reporter to visit the Titanic in a Russian submersible over 20 years ago. At one point, he thought he was going to die. I spoke with him just a little bit earlier. Doctor, thank you so very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, just a horrific outcome for everyone, the saddest possible result. Yes, absolutely, Aaron. The, the thing no one wanted to hear was said today at that press conference. And of course, my heart is breaking. But honestly, it was news that I fully expected given the evidence all along the way. It was clear to me from the very beginning, um, and I've said this all week, that this was not just a failure of communications, this was a catastrophic failure. And I actually used that word. Interesting that the rear admiral at the press conference used that very same word. I had reason to believe that because this uh, vessel was designed to jettison its ballasts after 24 hours, whether the mission succeeded or not. It was automatic and so that it could float to the surface safely. That didn't happen. Then it also had a backup, electrical backup, in case that automatic one failed. That didn't happen. And then it even had another backup, which was compressed air, pneumatic, in case everything else failed, you could just push a button and manually uh, jettison the ballast so that the vessel could come to the top. When I understood that, they didn't just lose communication. There was, it was clear to me that something had happened to the entire vessel. And now, of course, we know that an hour and 40 some minutes, very early into their dive, they hadn't even reached the bottom. It usually takes about two to three hours to do that. So there may be about two thirds of the way down. Uh, something happened in the pressure vessel, presumably a weakness of some kind. You know the old saying, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Well, a pressure vessel is only as strong as its weakest point. And maybe there was a micro fracture that was acquired in previous journeys down to the Titanic or not, but something, there was a weakness. And the ocean is merciless. It will not forgive. It's pressing in on you in all directions. And even though they weren't at the bottom, there was sufficient pressure that whatever weakness was there, it was just, it was instantly. And, and honestly, Aaron, that is a huge consolation because these folks did not die a lingering death as we all worried that they might be suffering for days. No, it was instantaneous. They didn't even know what hit them. So thank God for that. Yeah, you, you've really summed that up so well. Everyone has just felt so sick watching this story, praying for some kind of positive outcome. But as you were almost expecting the worst, for most of us, though, we could not imagine what it would have been like. You can, though. You've been to the Titanic wreck, one of the first people to do it. You also got into trouble down there and, and essentially thought you were going to die. Can you explain what happened? I would tell you as background, it was in September of 2000. And <clears throat> I had been invited to be the first television correspondent to go down and report from the Titanic. I didn't want to, honestly, Aaron, because I, I have a fear of water. I've never even learned how to swim. And so my instinct was, oh gosh, of all things, I no. But of course, that was my job and I did it. Everything went well. Went down two and a half hours, uh, prayed at the bow of the ship for the people lost who lost their lives there. And then as we headed to the stern, we got uh, caught up in an underwater current that smashed us into the propeller, giant propeller, much bigger than our own sub. And we got somehow caught behind the blades. So we were caught between the, if you can imagine, between the body of the Titanic and these blades. And at that moment, when I felt the collision and then huge chunks of rusted uh, metal from the Titanic just rained down on us, I knew, wow, this is not a minor oopsie. 
Uh, this is a life-threatening situation. It was terrifying, probably the most terrifying thing I've ever experienced in my life. And I'm, I've been to the North Pole, the South Pole. I've been in war zones, but that rates right on top. Scary. Do you feel like the whole world is kind of closing in on you? What's it like to be stuck in such a small place, I guess, facing your own mortality? And do you interact with other people? I'm just trying to get a sense of what that would have been like. Interesting, when I first got inside, before they closed the hatch, I thought, oh, Lordy, not only do I have a fear of water, but this is a real tight quarters. It's a three-man sub. So it was me, my diving buddy, entirely spent the entire journey on our bellies on benches that had a little thin mattress, looking out an eight-inch porthole. Our pilot was in the middle, kind of sitting up. He had a big cockpit area and a much larger uh, porthole. But when you get in there and you get locked into that thing, and then you start descending and you lose sunlight almost immediately. First 400 feet and it goes, uh, lights out. And um, the interior of the sub starts sweating because the water is so cold in the North Atlantic that uh, whatever humidity is in the cabin starts condensing as uh, a rain, as, as it were. So you really, very quickly, you get this sense of, oh my gosh, I'm inside this little tin can. And when we had that accident, um, it felt as if I were buried alive under two and a half miles of water, if you can imagine that. Imagine having two and a half miles of water above you. And as I was trying to think of a way out, I, I realized, no, this is not like your car is stuck in the mud and you can call the towing service and they can tow you out. There's nobody around there. The North Atlantic is like in the middle of nowhere, period. And it's not like somebody can just yank you out of there. You're stuck behind these propeller blades and it's messy. So that's when I just kind of resigned myself that this was the end and the voice in my head said, this is how it's going to end for you. I thought of my wife. It was actually my anniversary. We, we were married in September. We had just been married. And uh, I thought, gee, I'm never going to see Laurel again. And I kind of took stock of my life where I'd been and all the things that I had survived, all the harmful assignments that I had done, dangerous assignments. And, but this was going to be the end of the journey. And then a funny thing happened, Darren, that I didn't expect. In the midst of all that sadness, it kind of gave way at one point to a sense of uh, utter peace. Mm -hmm. And as I was reporting on, the, on, the, on this vessel, I was hoping and praying that if, if indeed those people were still there and they were dying a slow death, that at least they might experience that peace I did. I can't explain it as a scientist, but there it is. It's what happened. Um, but fortunately, they didn't have to worry about that. They, it was instantaneous. They didn't even know what happened to them.